morning, good afternoon. Um, today, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Marshall Chin. Uh, Dr. Chin is a uh, is the Richard Perillo Family Distinguished Professor of Healthcare Ethics at the University of Chicago. is a practicing practicing general internist and health services researcher who has dedicated his career to advancing health equity through interventions at individual, organizational, community, and policy levels. Through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Advancing Health Equity, Leading Care, Payment, and Systems Transformation Program, Dr. Chin collaborates with teams of state Medicaid agencies, Medicaid managed care organizations, frontline healthcare delivery organizations, and community based organizations to implement payment reforms to support and incentivize care transformations that advance health equity within an anti racist framework. He also co-chairs the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network Health Equity Advisory Team. Dr. Chin evaluates the value of the federally qualified health center program, improves diabetes outcomes in, South, in Chicago's South Side through healthcare and community interventions, and improves shared decision-making among clinicians and LB, LGBTQ persons of color. He also applies ethical principles to reforms to advance health equity, discussions about culture of equity, and what it means for health professionals to care and advocate for their patients. Dr. Chin uses improv and stand-up comedy, storytelling, and theater to improve training of students in caring for diverse patients and engaging in constructive discussions around systemic racism and social privilege. Dr. Chin is a graduate of Harvard College and the University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine, and he completed residency and fellowship training in general and internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He has received mentoring awards from the Society of General Internal Medicine and University of Chicago. He is a former president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. Dr. Chin was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2017 and is on the steering committee for the National Academy of Medicine paper series on structural racism and health and is a co-author of the Asian American paper and cross-cutting solutions paper. It is my pleasure to introduce you today, Dr. Chin, and we all look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks very much, Megan. So I have an ambitious agenda for us over the next hour that you can see from the title, it's uh, pretty diverse, but integrated. And it reflects then a lot of the work that I've been grappling with over the past several years to addressing medical and social needs, racism, and payment to advance health equity. So I'll start with a story that uh, so my general internist and I see patients in the outpatient setting as well as uh, uh, two to four weeks of the year in the inpatient setting. And it's now been maybe a year and a half ago that one of my patients came to see me. And this is a retired professor of the social sciences here at USC, person that's yeah, seven or 70s or getting close to 80 probably, and uh, a, a wise person. And uh, he said to me, I'm concerned about our country, Marshall. And I remember he mentioned three things. One was income inequality. The second was uh, lack of action on climate change. And the third was he said that we need to have two sane political parties, or well, two, two sane political parties really to survive as a country. And he was concerned. And I, I do think we're entering a, a difficult period. We are in a difficult period and it could get more difficult regarding the partisanship and the sense of divide in our country. This is Karen Dale, and she co-chairs this Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Health Equity Advisory Team that I, I'm the other co-chair of. Karen is amazing. She's a nurse by background, uh, a, a counselor's background. She's now like senior leadership. She's like CEO of one of the health plans in Washington, D.C. So very experienced, and she's worked in Washington, D.C. government also. And uh, she has this phrase distinguishing between what she calls performative virtue signaling actions versus substantive authentic actions to advance health equity. So in some ways health equity has become like the, the flavor du jour and a lot of popularity now. And too often we're perhaps seeing the former, uh, what she again, these, these performative actions that really maybe are, are checking a box in terms of, well, we're doing something with health equity as opposed to something that will be truly sort of getting at, at root causes and, and addressing the situations. So three learning goals for today. I'm gonna talk about addressing medical and social needs, racism and payment to advance health equity, 
Second, we're going to discuss then the underlying ethics for advancing health equity. And I'll end with uh, really a, a bit about communication and describing free, frank, fearless, and empathetic discussion around health equity. Here's the agenda. I'll talk a little bit about my, my positionality, defining health equity, what is equitable health care. I'll talk about uh, anti racist approaches to care transformation and payment, ethical issues, and I'll end with a communication piece. So this is the young me. <laughs> this is maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. Uh, one of my clinic patients at the time, typical patient, middle-aged, African-American woman with chronic diseases. So if you look at this picture, you might superficially see differences. Doctor, white coat, lay person, young Chinese-American man, um, older African-American woman. And I had uh, trained as Megan said at San Francisco and in Boston. And many of my clinic patients in, in Boston were African-American from the Roxbury and Dorchester neighborhoods. However, I rapidly realized coming to Chicago that, that everything is contextual. Uh, Chicago compared to San Francisco or Boston has in absolute numbers, many more African-Americans and a much higher percentage of the population is African-American. And then here in Hyde Park, South Side, of course, there was the history, the local history embedded within the national history. And so I, I, I rapidly realized that, well, you know, I need to understand this history and in this context. At the same time, though, if you go beyond the superficial appearance, there's actually, I think, a lot that um, I, I have in common with, with, with many of my patients and that I think all of us have um, across uh, many of our patients. This is my mom and dad's wedding picture. A uh, big immigrant family. Like uh, my dad, I think it has like 12 siblings. My mom, 10 or something like that. It's big, big families. And um, these are the boys in my, my father's family, his, his, his uh, siblings. Um, and they all worked in the laundries. So there's Uncle Winthrop on the left, who was a uh, eminently the ladies' man of the group. Um, my uh, father's father in the middle, who I've never seen smile in a picture. Um, Uncle Roger, who was a diehard Red Sox fan, and he, he he actually passed away before the Red Sox won the World Series, unfortunately. Uncle George, who was incredibly good with kids, and then Uncle Gilbert. And uh, many of my aunts and uncles were very talented people, but they clearly was a, a bamboo ceiling in terms of what they could do. Uh, um, most of the game, the, the aunts and uncles were in um, um, service industries, laundries, which is classic for immigrant families, um, only jobs you get. And so they worked in laundries, which were hard jobs. This is a Victorian trading card from the 1880s. These were used as advertisements. So on the back of this card would be some firm advertising. So, so some company thought this would be an attractive uh, um, image to use to advertise their, their products. Uh, so I see Chinese must go, the Missouri steam washer, you have the uh, Chinese um, uh, laundry man with sack of money running to China, the Chinese must go. And so there's a long historical and current history of structural racism against minoritized populations, oftentimes with an underlying sort of economic basis of, you know, why, why is this so uh, in terms of economic interest and all. Well, health equity. So many of you have seen this diagram. I like this, this uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, visual. So equality, everyone gets the same size bicycle regardless of the needs. At the bottom, equity, everyone gets the appropriate size vehicle to maximize their physical function. I also like the World Health Organization definition. So at the top, I talk about equity being the absence of avoidable or remedial differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. And then importantly, they add the social justice component. Health inequities also entail a failure to avoid or overcome inequalities that infringe on fairness in human rights norms. So the CMS group that I coach here, this is the definition that we decide to use for health equity which is largely the U.S. Healthy People 2030 definition with the addition of systemic racism. And you'll see that this definition incorporates the elements of the prior definitions. So equity, achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, which include systemic racism and the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. At the very top, you see the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So you see that again, the different elements I previously mentioned incorporate into this one definition with the addition of systemic racism. So what is equitable health care? So one way of thinking about it is, well, how people have thought about, well, how do you measure this? Because oftentimes like in healthcare, you wanna have a metrics and you wanna reward ideally for people that do well with equity. 
And so National Quality Forum, they they one of these accreditation organizations for metrics. So it's now six years ago. We talked about different domains for health equity, access to care, high quality care, structure for equity, talk more about that, a culture of equity, partnerships and collaborations such as with the community. So many of you have heard of uh, NCQA, so HEDIS measures. So they in the California Healthcare Foundation, the more recent paper from 2023, the amount of overlap in the domains. So they talk about overall in the middle, which bottom line is the overall well-being of patients and populations. And then you see around these different domains, so equitable social interventions, like health, social needs screening, equitable access, equitable high quality care, equitable experience of care. So for example, uh, is there discrimination and equitable structures of care? So for example, um, how diverse uh, are the personnel at, 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 the, at the hospital? Um, do you have good uh, interpreter services, for example? But it's just a way of, sort of breaking down equitable health care into different components conceptually. I think we look at the definitions of high quality primary care, uh, it often sort of tracks well with what is equitable care. So this is from a National Academy report from three years ago, provision of whole person integrated accessible and equitable healthcare by interprofessional teams who are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health and well-being needs across settings and through sustained relationships with patients, families, and communities. So it's a lot to embed in that. And I think you'll start to see too that, well, you know, these are things that basically there's no, there's little incentive in the healthcare system to do this. You know, this is one of the reasons why there's a crisis in primary care. So we've done about a dozen reviews, systemic, these systematic reviews of the health equity intervention literature. And this is the slide that, that summarizes well the bottom line. And so in some ways it's not rocket science that it, they all devolve down to like the bullet statement that these successful health equity interventions basically encourage close relationship with patients and they holistically address medical and social needs and have close follow-up and monitoring. So you know, when, I, when I give a talk to clinicians, they all say, well, yeah, we know that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, more specifically, there are, these are things like multifactorial interventions that address different drivers of inequities, culturally tailored approaches better than generic approaches, good evidence for team-based care, oftentimes nurse-led team-based care, community health workers, lay health workers, and then not surprisingly involving families and communities in the solutions. So as Megan said, I have, I have these couple of national roles um, and the next few slides, so much are, uh, a lot of the lessons come from these, these learnings. And both of these efforts, they try to identify best ways and practices to ensure that payment flows towards healthcare delivery structures, personal and partners that provide equitable care and outcomes. So I call this my magic carpet slide. And so I feel like one of the big problems in equity is that we, we don't do nearly a good enough job connecting the dots on the pathway to health equity. So the far left represents where we are, the far right represents if we had an equitable system. And we often will do some general intervention. Like we may say, well, we're gonna do a cultural competency training, right? And then we're gonna magically think that's gonna to lead to health equity. Or, you know, we'll do a, a policy intervention like, well, we're gonna change from fee-for-service payment to value-based payment and you know that will solve things. But that's sort of like wishful thinking, magical thinking. In practice, we're trying to change the behavior of individuals, the behavior organizations. And there's gotta be a logic model of why a certain action, whether it's some type of training, whether it's a policy action, how that leads to a change, which leads to another change, which leads to another change, which would lead to the intended change of behavior of the people and organizations you're trying to influence. Uh, one of our Robert Wojcicki Foundation program officers, her, her mantra for our program as well, it's not payment reform for payment reform's sake, but it's payment reform that supports and incentivizes the care transformation. It's not just any care transformation, but it's care transformation that addresses medical and social needs to advance health equity. So that's one example of like a one sentence, a little bit of a connecting the dots. And there's a lot that's embedded in there that has to happen then for it to actually work. She had two like uh, schematic slides here. So, and they both depict variations of a roadmap to advance health equity. This is from an editorial from three, four years ago. So you see at the very top there that this is all moot unless we really are committed to the mission of improving equity and that we are intentional about things. And it gets back to that thing about virtual signaling performative actions that it's everyone at the organization from the front line of senior leadership that just can't get lip service. They truly have to prioritize and to put the resources in it to be able to then truly advance health equity. You see in the middle, there's this, this, this line about uh, implementing a roadmap to reduce disparities. 
So losses follows quality improvement uh, principles. So identifying the disparity, doing a root cause analysis to determine why the disparities exist, designing your interventions to address those root causes, designing payment to support that. On the left, though, you see culture of equity. And uh, oftentimes we uh, tend to focus upon the technical aspects. So something like, you know, design the intervention. Um, what we found is that if you don't address the cultural part, you're rapidly going to sort of reach a limit in terms of how far you can go, probably because you need to have the buy-in, again, of the different organiz of the whole parts of the organization to for it to work. So this culture of equity partly is the understanding the in your own personal biases. This is where the cultural humility training comes in. But then this is newer. It's our, but both individuals as organizations identify those systemic structures that bias against and oppress marginalized populations. So the, you know, Chicago, like, like uh, pretty much everywhere, you know, um, has it embedded. And um, I think to the universe, there is just credit, we're doing more so than 10 years ago regarding having that harder inward look. And it's, we have a long way to go, um, but we're making progress. You see in the middle, the bottom line is that every worker has to know how to operationalize advancing health equity in your daily job. So the local story is that like, we're in like year 12 of our official DEI journey here at university. And uh, maybe four years of the effort, we had a survey of the different staff in, 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 at the University of Chicago Medicine. And at that point, like much of the training had been more the cultural humility training and all. And so the feedback we, the, well, we got was that, well, love the training. However, we don't have a foggiest idea of how we actually apply that to our daily jobs if we are like in accounting or data analytics or for uh, patient experience and all. So it has to be tangible in terms of how does it, what does it mean in terms of people's daily jobs? At the far right, you see the payment part, and then you see a lot of interest now in the social drivers of health, both addressing individual social drivers for individual people, as well as the partnerships with communities to address the systemic structural drivers in the community. At the very bottom, improving health and health equity. Okay, so here's in some ways the same, the same concepts organized in a slightly different way. Um, so I talked about how ultimately we have to change the behaviors of individuals and organizations. And if the goal is sustainable change at large scale, no one has all the power. So that's why both like the Robert Johnson Foundation effort and the CMS effort involves multiple stakeholders. It involves the payers, it involves the health plans, it involves the healthcare delivery organizations like the University of Chicago, it involves community-based organizations. So they have to work together basically to align payment, care transformation and all. Um, you see in the middle there that, again, for the collaboration is the work that has to be trust and motivation. There has to be a great leadership. There has to be well-functioning teams. Um, it's got to be a shared mission and purpose and, and buy-in and all. Um, you see the roadmap steps around that, like these QI steps we had already mentioned. On the far left, you have built out a little bit more detailed cultures of equity. And so what we're doing here at the University of Chicago, and then we're incorporating our Robert Johnson Foundation program, we have a critical theory perspective on this. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about this. The parts that involve um, specifically addressing structural racism, uh, issues of um, uh, intersectional systems of oppression, addressing power and hierarchy. And then very importantly, there's a relational part to it. Um, a lot of change at a local level really is dependent upon relationships and understanding those power dynamics. If you look at the second to the last column, these intermediate outcomes on the steps based on equity, look at the first two up at the top in particular. So on the, the first top is the technical part. So implementing the care transformation, implementing the payment reforms. The, the second one is again, equally important is shifting the culture is shifting the policies, is shifting the processes by which we work and act. So again, they go hand in hand, the technical part and then the cultural part. And that's one of the challenges because like, um, there's not a lot of efforts that um, try to do this or do it well. And oftentimes the people who are good at one don't have experience in the other. That's, that's the challenge. Okay, anti-racist approaches. So we use this as an example of like digging the cultures of equity and then um, structural racism being just one of, of a variety of different types of systems of oppression. And, and then we'll make a concrete care transformation and payment. Um, so there's some definitional things. So um, I like Kamara Jones' uh, work in this area. She, she's the best I've seen at being able to describe racism in lay terms that everyone can understand in ways that are as non-threatening as possible. So I'll go over her global definition and then her three levels of racism. Her global definition, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on phenotype, i.e. race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and undermines the realization of the full potential of the whole society to the waste of human resources. So that last bullet, you start seeing the, the parallel to then the definition of health equity, everyone at, uh, attaining their maximum health potential. 
Okay, she talks about internalized racism, acceptance by members of a stigmatized racist of negative images, messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth. It is characterized by their not believing in others who look like them and not believing in themselves. She's a great speaker. And so the example she gives in her talks uh, about African-Americans, she uses the uh, example of um, white, my, white man's ice is colder. The idea that um, um, if, uh, if an African-American had a stigmatized uh, view, they would think, oh, I'm gonna buy the ice from the white uh, seller of ice because the white man's ice must be colder. Personally immediate racism, prejudice and discrimination where prejudice means differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intentions of others according to their race. And discrimination means differential actions towards others according to their race. Personally immediate racism can be intentional as well as unintentional. It includes acts of commission as well as acts of omission. This is the type of racism that I think people tend to think about when they hear, hear the lay word racism. So it's interpersonal immediate racism. And then more recently, there's been more awareness and recognition discussion of institutionalized racism, differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. Institutionalized racism is normative, sometimes legalized, and often manifests as inherited disadvantage. It is structural, having been codified in our institutions of custom, practice, and law. So there need not be an identifiable perpetrator. Indeed, institutionalized racism is often evident as inaction in the face of need. Institutionalized racism manifests itself both in material conditions and in access to power. So a lot embedded in that one paragraph. And then intersectionality. So the classic Kimberly Crenshaw, so she's like the, actually the concept goes back centuries. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw is probably the most uh, famous of the uh, modern um, writers about intersectionality. And, and the, the University of Chicago Legal Forum is maybe the, one of the most cited of her papers in this area. So intersectionality, the combination of intersecting systems of oppression that perpetuate discrimination and disadvantage based on factors such as race, class, sex, and gender identity. If you, uh, if, if you have more time, Google um, Kimberly Crenshaw, New York Times, um, Clarence Thomas hearings. Um, then you'll get a sense of like um, her own personal role in that, that story and um, why intersectionality is important to her. Uh, in particular, she's looking at like um, the feminist movement and intersecting with um, uh, uh, racial politics. So how do, what does this mean in terms of healthcare? And so uh, I think like for our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program, for many years, we would have what I would call a general health equity lens, which is the, the dominant way that um, I think most people in health equity think about in healthcare, think about um, the equity issue. So we might phrase a question like on the left, why do black children with asthma have higher rates of hospitalization than white children with asthma? An anti-racist lens might change that to being phrased as on the right, why is our health system less successful helping black children with asthma avoid hospitalization than white children with asthma? So one of the, the so I mentioned that we had done like these dozen systematic reviews in the literature. And when you look at the equity literature, the vast majority of interventions address problems at the level of the individual. And you know, there's a lot of good things about that. I mean, you know, we want to be patient-centered and tailored to the individual. But in some ways, that it's worse though, it falls from the trope of like blaming the individual for their problems as opposed to looking at the structural issues. So for example, we don't do nearly a, a good enough job in terms of thinking about what are the organizational ways that we have a stacked desk against um, minoritized populations? What are better ways we can organize the University of Chicago to better provide more equitable care, um, let alone then like the policy aspects, the policy level the areas. So when you ask the question on the right, you see the different in lens, it takes you on a different route in terms of the root cause analysis and then the types of interventions that you come up with. So a little bit more about critical theory. So, I talked about like uh, care transformation and payment with an equity lens and care transformation with a payment form with a critical consciousness and anti-racism lens. So these are three of my colleagues. Um, so the bottom left, um, that's uh, Sivan Spitzer Shohat. She's an Israeli organization sociologist. And, and, and Sivan and I, we, we think fairly similarly. Um, elsewhere on the slide, that's uh, Scott Cook and um, uh, Yelena Todek. Um, they're to the left of me politically. Um, and they um, have a very strong background in critical theory. And I would say it took like about a year of discussions between the four of us um, where we understood one another. Um, language is very important and you, you use the same word but have different meanings. So it literally took 
thought my Savannah myself a year to understand um, Scott and Yelena and, and critical theory in more detail. And I have to say that like um, the more they explain and finally getting it, um, a lot of what they say makes a lot of sense. Um, so critical theory, it emphasizes power analysis as an approach to understanding and transforming structures by targeting the root causes of social injustice. Structure refers to political, social, cultural, historical, and economic forces that influence individual behavior and that create critical patterns based on social location. You may hear this phrase, critical consciousness, um, Paulo Freire, pedagogy of the oppressed. The ability to read the world critically and take action to transform it. Praxis, a technical term that you may have heard of also. The ongoing process of reflection and action aimed at understanding and transforming the world. That's why, for example, and I see David Rubin here, um, for those of us who like, do training of a variety of health professionals about equity, most of the best training does involve some element of self-reflection exercises. And part of that is, uh, is, is part of this process of praxis if the goal is to motivate change and action. Uh, so what are, what are the implications of this then? So at the very micro personal level, so think about our, each of us as individuals, it's our ability to recognize these structural issues in terms of the relationships among people. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's addressing the relational dynamics, addressing, addressing a discomfort with conflict and earning trust and sharing power with community. And this is something that, um, you know, we're trying to get better at, like within our own Robert Johnson Foundation program. The power dynamic one is um, it's a tricky one, for example, that um, so it's about something like healthcare and, and medicine, surgery, incredibly hierarchical structures. And, um, you know, another survey we did, um, we did this organizational survey. There were like these four different paradigms of uh, organizational structure. By far, the most dominant paradigm at the University of Chicago reported by staff is um, hierarchical culture. So we're embedded sort of in a culture and organization which is just based upon hierarchy. Um, and so, and we don't do a very good job of discussing this in detail regarding some ways there's certain benefits to it. So something like um, experience and you know the patient care and, and quality and safety and all. At the same time, um, it can be a big inhibitor in terms of um, having honest discussions about a variety of charged issues. Uh, measles, organizational level, mid-level, ensuring equity focused implementation and operations of a place like UCM, macro structural enacting policies that support the micro and meso level efforts. So again, it, it, just like um, Kamara Jones, she has like these three different levels. Similarly, it, it translates to our actions and the way we think about equity in terms of interventions, these different levels. So this is, to me, I, I was sort of thinking about one of the best examples about racism in healthcare and interventions. And so I think maybe one of the best, maybe the best example I can think of is obstetric racism. Uh, if I don't know if there are any OBGYNs here. Um, so when you read this literature, um, so racism drives much of the black white inequities in pregnancy related mortality rates, preterm births and low birth uh, weight births. And then when you look at the different interventions, um, they tend to address the, the interpersonal um, bias and racism as well as the structural elements. So for example, um, this uh, intervention is called community support persons, lay people who would be present and accompanying uh, the patient throughout childbirth and it's, then that's been demonstrated to reduce patient report experiences of obstetric racism. So it's pretty horrendous literature regarding qualitative research and the experiences of African American moms uh, with the healthcare system. Um, and so it's, it's just sort of like the analysis of like if everyone had, you know, that family member or friend who's going to be the advocate that um, is going to stick up for the patient um, there. So the many people here have a healthcare background, and so you know the role when you're playing that role to basically be the, the watchdog over sort of a loved one or a friend or family member. Um, the bottom um, bullet, um, the obstetric equity literature, they, they talk a lot about sort of reproductive justice. And there are those in our, our here in our university. So uh, what Julie uh, Core, um, her talks and whatnot, uh, have a lot of this. Um, Cecil Lynn, I'll be another person. So these community informed models that incorporate principles of reproductive justice, such as midwifery led and doula supported care and also at least been shown to improve black perinatal outcomes. So strong literature there. Um, it can apply to payment also. So Kim Singletary and I, we have this paper in uh, a major journal of ethics from about a year ago. Um, we talked about different mechanisms to uh, which sort of racism is built into payment and then solutions. I'll, I'll give you one example and make it concrete. Um, there's a, a sociologist at Cornell, Jamila Mishner, who's a UC grad, PhD in sociology, I believe, um, who, 
Um, she writes about this, and, and she writes uh, some missing histories about this. Um, so um, 1965, Great Society Programs, President Johnson is negotiating with Congress. So Medicare, national program, benefits all. Um, to get the Southern votes he needed to um, pass the legislation, the deal that was cut was a trade-off with Medicare, Medicaid. So Medicare will be a, a national program, federal control. Medicaid, joint federal state control, which allowed the Southern states to maintain control then over their African-American populations. So when you look at these heat maps, for example, of where the greatest inequities are in the US, well, the South lights up. When you look at issues like uh, where this underfinancing of Medicaid, where Medicaid is least generous, you know, again, the South lights up. So, you know, how can you sort of have policy reform without understanding that historical context which lives to today in terms of thinking about then those dynamics that play out in terms of trying to enact change. So again, the thing about like insurance and Medicaid, well, you could do things to improve the scope of insurance to, to meet medical social needs. So things like covering health related social needs, encouraging partnerships between the healthcare delivery organizations and these community-based organizations to address the structural social drivers of health. Um, there's another sort of insidious one here where there's a double standard where like, um, this is so much inefficiency in what, what's, um, paid for in healthcare, whereas when you think about Medicaid uh, coverage of the, of the poor and, and marginalized, there's a higher bar. Well, you know, policies have to be cost savings or cost neutral, you know, and as we know, there are very few interventions in healthcare that are cost savings. There's a lot that would be cost effective in terms of um, improving health at a reasonable cost. But if you, the, the criteria is cost savings, cost neutrality, that's a much higher bar as opposed to something like you know, you think about like the Alzheimer's drugs, for example, and what has been covered uh, by in the past, uh, you know, it's just like um, um, double standard. So I have one slide. So more generally about payment. So payment, you can rapidly go down these rabbit holes where it starts getting arcane and complicated. I think, though, if you understand these three bullets, they'll take you a long way when you think about any type of payment initiative. Um, so you might think about like, how can payment be used to advance health equity? One, the first one is what people tend to think about, just creating a over incentive to reward someone for um, in, 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 in reducing disparities and uh, advancing health equity, so-called value-based payment and performance-based incentives that reward equitable processes and outcomes. The second is upfront funding. So for example, a capitation, or you may have heard like these uh, programs that have a per member per month fee that's given to a place like uh, University of Chicago. So you have upfront money, that money could go to different places. It could go to steerholders. It could go towards the orthopedic wing, right? Or it could go towards community health workers, right? Or the IT systems that link patients then to social services. The third is then risk adjusting payment for social risks. And so this is what the University of Chicago sort of complains about that they, they'll argue, well, we um, serve a high percentage of uh, Medicaid population and we get killed because the, um, uh, the reimbursement rates um, are too low. So one's potential solution is risk adjusting payment for more payment for uh, populations at higher social risk. So about five or six years ago, I spent a summer in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, writing a paper with colleagues there, comparing the two countries about how they're addressing health equity. Uh, these were the authorship team. Um, notable things, upper right, that's my mentor at the, uh, for that project, Sarah Derrett. And if you look in the background, you see sheep. And it is true that there are more sheep in uh, a tour in New Zealand than people. Um, the far left, um, those were three of the co-authors who are Maori, the indigenous peoples of, of uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And one of the best things about the project was that um, we had like dozens of these tough conversations and um, they were great. And, and um, my experience has been that when you talk to indigenous peoples, whether here in the US or you know, whether uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives or Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders or uh, the Maori in this particular case, um, they often are, are tough in terms of like um, um, really having the, the tough conversations. Uh, I think because you know, historically they have been treated so poorly. And what they taught me was that when you do the deep dive, the root cause and just dive deeper, 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 deeper. Um, the challenge about these systems of oppression, the challenge about these conversations is that ultimately power is the issue. It's control over resources, it's control over the historical narrative. So I've, I've mentioned a little bit earlier this issue, I'll talk about more about this issue of like, 
you could have a historical narrative of blaming the individual, you know, you know, the blaming the individual for, you know, their plight versus, you know, to what degree has the system been set up to basically create a no-win situation, um, control over the frame of equity. So, yeah, we literally had, like, in many discussions about structural racism, colonialism, this is, we don't talk about this much in our, in our country, um, and I think I finally have a better sense of colonialism after talking to Maori about this. Uh, in the U.S., it, we don't have a great history about this. So the American Indians or uh, things like the Philippines, New York Times had a recent article about this, pretty, pretty um, hard article about um, basically our colonial policies. And you look at the, the, the Philippines, why are they one of the few countries in uh, uh, that area of Asia where there's not sort of a strong tech background? They're very agrarian still. And so really it's a tough situation of like, how are you gonna create sort of an economy that um, will uh, benefit many of the people that basically have subsistence living upon farming. It's not by chance. And a lot of it's like um, the post-World War II and, and earlier policy set up by the US um, and social privilege. So many of you may have heard this term and heard of Robin DeAngelo. She's a white sociologist somewhere on the white West Coast. Um, she defined this term that got a lot of late press, uh, white fragility. Uh, racial stress can lead to defensive emotions and behaviors in whites, such as anger, fear, guilt, argument, silence, or withdrawal. It can be weaponized. And so um, the way my Maori colleagues um, put it, and they insisted on the sentence in our paper, Discomfort cannot be a reason to avoid dialogue, or then white fragility would in essence be a tool to perpetuate inequities in the power structure. Oh, we can't talk about it. It's too politically charged. We can't go there. Uh, it's gonna make people uncomfortable. Um, Maori pointed out that is, you know, when it comes down to it, kind of a, a lame argument to make to basically justify continued persecution of the Maori indigenous peoples, other minoritized populations. So solutions, looking for racism, searching explicitly and being intentionally into racist solutions, integrating the medical and social. I'll talk about distributed justice in a moment. Engaging the community authentically, sharing power, addressing mistrust. You've heard this phrase, progress moves at the speed of trust. And then communication. And I'll talk more about this in storytelling and deep narrative. Um, and this came up being like a call I was on yesterday that if you don't speak up, if you're not intentional about this, there basically is invisibility. Um, this is my wife, and we wrote this paper um, about Asian Americans, and a, a whole variety of reasons why too often, all too often, Asian Americans are uh, sort of invisible uh, regarding sort of structural racism. Okay, ethical issues, McLean conference talk. Um, so some of this is influenced by. Um, uh, one of my teachers, Judith Sklar, and I'll talk more about that but later. And so liberalism, I'm talking about liberalism, not as in liberal as conservative, but liberalism, the moral and political philosophy, this values individual rights and liberty. And as we talked about, the U.S. holds the individual responsible for their situation. The U.S. downplays systemic structural factors that influence outcomes. One of the best courses I took in college was a literature course, and it was entitled The Myth the mythology of America. And so if you think about things like the Western and like the, the mythology of the, the rugged individual the lawman, right? Um, or, you know, the old Horatio Alger, uh, pull yourself by your bootstraps type of stories. Again, that uh, US individualistic perspective downplaying the structural. And then government. So the US brand of liberalism emphasizes the role of government in protecting the freedom of individuals. You know. You could still be have a liberalism philosophy and say, oh, we're going to prioritize using the government to enable individuals to maximize the potential, including health. But we have a former in terms of uh, protecting the freedom of the individual that has economic implications. So we tend to favor the individual rights to property and take sort of as a given the value of the unfettered free market. So we accept the externalities in the, in, uh, of a free market system in terms of the um, problems in terms of distributive justice. So uh, this is a paper, if you haven't seen it, it's well worth reading. The first author is Joe Brush, who's in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Senior author is Colleen Grogan from Social Service Administration. Short article, very well done. 
It's, it reviews the financialization of healthcare in the U.S. They talk about the rise of the private equity, and it's kind of a sad story. The siphoning of healthcare dollars, many of them governmental, like Medicare, Medicaid, into profit for shareholders outside the healthcare system. So it's not, I don't think, what the what the public or health or government had in mind then in terms of like a Medicare and Medicaid dollars. So I'll turn to the ethical frameworks. I'll talk a little bit about distributed justice and utilitarianism. So justice being the socially just allocation of resources and opportunities in society, utilitarianism maximizing utilities. So, you know, we've we've had Rawls here in terms of like the, the fellows. Um, I saw him once. So I, I went um, shopping, shopping period. I went to um, first one of one of his classes and it just seemed like it's going to be over my head. So did not go to class number two. But, you know, they talk about the veil of ignorance so that um, the idea being that if um, um, we developed a society based on before we knew our position in society, before if we knew if we were going to be rich or poor, black, brown, white, brown, um, whether we're going to be a man, woman, or um, gender fluid, um, we would come up with a fairer situation than the current system where inevitably um, those with more power try to influence the system so that um, it accrues their self-interest. Utilitarianism. So policy-wise, we have this in the U.S., um, this inherent pushback or even policy prohibitions against using societal cost effectiveness analysis to allocate resources. Um, again, probably a large part of this is the self-interest of, of organizations that instead, special interests they benefit from not having cost-effective analysis. Um, and, you know, the healthcare industry, I mean, we're guilty also. We are reluctant to reallocate wasteful resource expenditures towards um, um, health equity. And I think, you know, the healthcare providers and staff here, we're all aware of the plenty of, 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 of race in terms of uh, how we allocate our money. Okay, so this is Judith Sklar. She's um, um, probably one of the two or three best teachers I had in college. Um, I, I um, had her as a teacher towards the end of her career, um, physically short, I think probably less than five feet tall, incredibly intimidating and absolutely brilliant. Um, wonderful teacher, I challenged you all the time. Um, this was a course where we read like um, original texts, like 300 pages of original texts each week. So Edmund Burke, um, J.S. Mill, uh, Michelet for populism, Marx, um, Hitler, we read Mein Kampf for Nazism. Um, and uh, Sklar is interesting because um, she was born Jewish in Latvia. And when she was about like 13, 11 or 13 years old, her family, um, I think it was like somehow like via Canada, eventually ended up in the U.S., but immigrated in 39, so just missed um, Nazism and Stalinism. So it's a miracle that she survived. Um, but I always find her compelling because um, brilliant thinker, abstract thinker. And then you could tell by her writings and her, her talks that she had, a, um, her worldview was rooted in um, the lived experience of um, the excesses of the left, the excesses of the right. Uh, so very interesting woman. And um, so this, uh, during like, like her eulogy or during like a special issue devoted to um, her after she had passed away, one of her colleagues at Harvard wrote, Sklar once wrote, there, there are two kinds of political scientists, those who study power because they like to exert it, and those who study it because they fear it, those who would like to ride the horse of power, and those who are scared of being trampled by it. They make this uh, 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 distinction between like Henry Kissinger being like the former, really a power guy, and then Sklar would be um, the latter in terms of like uh, the fear of, of power. Um, and Sklar wrote that she that she felt like cruelty was the worst sin. She defined cruelty as deliberate infliction of physical and secondarily emotional pain upon a weaker person or group by stronger ones in order to achieve some end. And then she argued that by putting cruelty unconditionally first with nothing above us to excuse or forgive acts of cruelty, one closes off any appeal to any order than that of actuality. And she specifically mentioned like religion or, or politics being sort of like uh, these extenuating arguments. To put cruelty first, therefore, is to be at odds not only with religion, but also with normal politics as well. And then if you think about it, like in healthcare, well, you know, I'd argue that two-tiered under-resourced healthcare systems that lead to health disparities for marginalized populations are cruel, that healthcare delivery systems and payment systems that are not designed to meet the medical and social needs of marginalized patients are cruel, 
and that systems that accept the status quo and ignore racism disparities are cruel. Um, credit to my wife, Naoko Muramatsu, and then Hara Pollock from the Ethics Center um, for help getting this SEO with a finish line that um, I kept rejection after rejection after rejection. They said, look, rethink it. So they became co-authors, helped me re redo it, and then uh, got accepted. Um, one of the great things um, about writing articles, I, uh, I found this article by Toni Morrison, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, where she made parallels between racism and fascism as tools to consolidate power, which I think have, and this was written in 1995, so that's five, 28 years ago, um, but I think it has incredible relevance for 2024. So these parallels um, both say construct an internal enemy, isolate and demonize an enemy, enlist and create sources and distributors of information who are willing to reinforce in that demonizing process, criminalize the enemy, reward mindlessness and apathy with monumentalized entertainments and with little pleasures, maintain at all costs silence. So, you know, I think like if you read that, you would not know whether we we're talking the Sklar of 1939, whether we we're talking today. It's uh, equally relevant. We end our, this is the last paragraph of our article. So Sklar understood that persistent cruelty more frequently results from the failure of bystanders to intervene than what Dr. King rightly called the appalling silence of the good people than it does from the outright evils committed by the few. To be serious about eradicating cruelty, we must all use our personal agency to address structural racism and other system oppression. Medical, nursing, social work, and public health communities have special responsibilities to exercise this vigilance, given the severe health consequences of cruelty. So does everyone else. So sometimes, you know, I'll give a talk and people say, well, yeah, this all makes a lot of sense, Marshall. Sounds incredibly pessimistic. So, you know, what, 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 what glimmers of hope do we have? What do you suggest? Uh, moving ahead. And so I'm going to uh, spend the rest of the time talking about some aspects of that above and beyond the structural things I've already mentioned regarding things like the payment and care transmission and all. Um, they have to do with communication. So RAND Corporation Survey 2016 um, basically found that uh, the public supports a fair and just opportunity for health. So question, our society should do whatever is necessary to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be healthy. Two thirds of the population agree. Yet, why does we have such a hard time than getting such legislation and policies passed? Part of the problem is communication. And so, this is a, a figure from AMA, WNC. They have this um, language narrative about um, equity. And they talk about this pyramid of, of messaging. So, at the very bottom, you might have and any given thing you, you write or say, there's a message, right? And there are words and images that convey that message. Above that, you may have a story, you know, conveying a story. Above that, that's a narrative, a collection of stories and messages that represent an idea or belief. They highlight the values, they define the problem, they determine the solutions and actions. But then more insidiously, you have deep narrative, the deeply held values that have repeated and been reduced over time, they're baked in. So for example, I'm currently working on the structural racism paper, Asian American structural racism. We're highlighting three non-health sectors, of which one is the media. So we give countless examples, and I think it applies to just about any type of mar minoritized, marginalized population of like the biases, the stereotypes uh, that are present about Asian Americans in films or Asian American in the media and whatnot. You know, you you would be able to describe what these stereotypes are. The problem is that like for much of the population being exposed to this because it's part of the deep narrative, so incredibly powerful in terms of like the beliefs that people implicitly have. Um. So the paper that uh, Monica Peak and Monica Bell and I wrote from three, four years ago, um, we had 12 practical tips about teaching about race and racism. Most, one of them is you start with stories. You don't start with facts. Um, the point being that you start with facts and statistics. People, because people, are not a, they basically tune out when you start in that as opposed to starting with stories and the lived experience. So how do you message? And so the Robert Tenth Justice Foundation, they, they hired a communications firm to do focus groups across the political spectrum. So from the far right to the, the far left, um, and trying to figure out what, what's the best way to message about uh, structural racism. So this is the visual that works. So on the left, you see the bridges, barriers. So uh, structural racism will be things like industries put toxic dumps in neighborhoods. 
Um, businesses make it easier to find liquor and healthy food. The far right, you find the, the, the proactive part. So you have anti-air pollution laws. People can get quality health care from doctors who respect them. Public budgets fund schools and parks. And then there's actually words and, and ways to phrase and organize the message which works. So we have two examples, and I'll read you one of them. And it's a formula of this. Again, it's pulled well across the political spectrum. So first you start with shared values. We all want to live in the United States where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to reach their best health, health and well-being, no matter their race, ethnicity, or class. So that's a shared value. You then segue into positive vision. That can happen by making sure everyone gets quality health care from doctors who respect them. It can happen when families live in communities with well-funded schools and parks instead of polluted air and toxic waste dumps and in neighborhoods with access to safe and affordable homes. We can build a society where people can move up economically and socially, then problem statement. But this is not everyone's reality today. That's because there are barriers built in front of some of us that create unequal opportunity and threaten freedom and prosperity, and then end with call to action by joining together, and then unity statement. We can unite, create a better future for everyone's children and grandchildren. So you can mull that over, and then when you think about it, there's a certain common sense aspect. You go, oh, I could see that working. Uh, and again, they empirically test this in, in these different um, focus groups. So I'll end with this. And so and one thing Megan put in my the bio is that um, so my other life, my wife and I started um, training and performing in improv and stand-up comedy six or seven years ago. And, and one of the fun things is we found that um, the skills we were learning actually translate well to the day job, and they translate well to teaching health equity. And so, um, so we published about this. Like, and in fact, like the, the fellows, um, we've done such ethics fellows in prior years. Um, and so, anyway, like a, the the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, they have this project called the Journalist Resource, where they try to they have this list of like forty five thousand journalists, and the overall part of that um, um, effort is to try to train the journalists to be more um, informed about different issues so they can write better, more informed articles. And one of the ways they do that is they, um, part of it's like what they call graphic journalism. And so they thought that this topic would be good for a graphic journalist article. And then there's a gifted graphic uh, journalist, Josh Newfeld. They ended up writing this um, um, article uh, that featured three academics with myself and two others. Um, so it's published online at this journalist resource in the Chicago Sometimes. Uh, placed in one of the Sunday editions, it basically uses comics to then to um, introduce people to all these, co these tough issues about communication and equity and whatnot. Um, this is the Sun Times um, story. So classic sometimes a Sunday edition story. You know, University of Chicago advertisement at the bottom, right? Um, far right. So the very top is um, the reference to our article. Right below that, so, so Chicago, Burke now 38th council member convicted in a half century. Uh, and then above us, so on the front, maybe the front page, um, then the reference to article, and then a six pages in the middle of the article. Um, so again, that's me. So my my son, you see, I says, "Oh, you think of the article?" My son, so not says, "You know, well, it made you look like the uh, the Chinese American Barack Obama in this picture." <laughs> yeah. Um, but you get an example, at the very bottom, for example, you see like um, it talks about improv and empathy and listening, building relationships, recognizing how the patient perceives you. Um, I highlighted like the work of two of our graphic medicine folks, um, Brian Callender and Shirley Obuobi, who have this self-portrait exercise to try to help people understand and, and their, their, their colleagues' lives better. So that actually is my self-portrait. No, no artist, but you're supposed to just do a self-portrait in the things that are important to you in your life. Um, and then, you know, but, but as an example, so um, you let's see, there's an NPR here, um, WBEZ, local Chicago NPR, they have um, a week lunch hour show called um, Reset with uh, Sasha and Simon. So they've heard about, they saw this um, Sometimes article and they ended up interviewing um, Josh and I, I think we got like, it's like a 15, 20 minute segment um, about that piece and then the water issues raised about equity and teaching and equity and racism, et cetera. Um, so, you know, this is a way to reach a broad, broad audience. I'll end there. So we'll take a few questions and then then, then we'll break and then we'll have uh, time with the fellows. So.
So, um, so that is the first question. Um, I don't, um, I, that wasn't intended. So the question was like, did, did I intend in the definition of racism to say that the healthcare is inherently, healthcare system is inherently racist and, and um, is one of the sources of the structural racism? That wasn't the intent. And I think it goes, you know, in some ways that we're the creatures of all of our environments. And so it ranges from like, as we talked a little bit of the media images and all to essentially how power plays out in regarding um, um, trying to create an other otherizing people of which race is one way to other people and to take advantage of that 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 um, population group to enhance his own power so in the case of like race and African Americans well you know um, a lot of wealth in this country was, was built upon slave labor you know um, but but you know but I think we're kidding ourselves if we don't say if we don't admit that um, a lot of the ways that we have set up health care the way we organize care the way we pay for care, um, these racist structures are already set in. Again, it's been an organizational and, and, and a policy level. It's the regulations, it's the policies, it's the way do, we do things. So again, that's part of this like hard inwards looks that organizations, including University of Chicago, are, are trying to do now. You know, it's, it's not comfortable. You know, there's no one nice to sort of look at oneself in the mirror and say, well, you know, there are some things that we've done as an organization or the way we're set up that um, are inherently racist or two tiered. I mean, we can go with them stories, and you know, there's some stories regarding. Um, um, Know, both bad stories as well as in some ways like um this is actually a, a great history of like um, the clinicians and staff here um saying no in terms of like um, um some of this um, ed is an example in terms of some stories there um but it wasn't my intent to, to, to um, uh, imply that well the source of the racism is, is the healthcare system yeah, yeah again Yeah, so I, I think regardless of whether you're a conservative or liberal, or whether we have a Democratic Republican administration, um, there are a variety of potential uh, ways to improve situations from a policy perspective that could work, um, regardless if you like if you're a, a proponent of a unfettered free market or or uh, a more regulatory approach. Um, the thing to do is, well, how do you create a business case for doing the right thing, a business case for um, supporting um, so-called social return on investment? You know, in some ways, so it, there are those who argue, well, you can't blame, you know, healthcare, or you can't blame University of Chicago for playing by the rules of the game. You know, this is the way that the, the, the system is set up. And then so you hear this, well, no margin, no mission. And, and there's a certain truth to that of, well, you know, you have to have a positive revenue line to do the mission of the academic health center and all. Um, but why not set up a set of free market rules and incentives, a set of, a set of uh, uh, relations where it's in everyone's interest to um, have certain strive for then equitable outcomes, equitable process of care, equitable quality of care. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's one example. Um, why not have a pay performance incentive, which is you are given more money if you um, have reduced an in equity in your care? Yeah. So lots of topics, so a lot you can ask about. Fire ahead. Okay. 